Please remain standing for the scripture from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. It was still the first day of the week, that evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's <coughs> sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he replied, Unless I see the nail marks in his hand, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, My God and my Lord. Jesus replied, Do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll, but these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in his name. Holy wisdom, holy Lord, word. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks, Tom. I don't know about you, but I thought uh, Teresa's uh, illustration was brilliant, don't you? That compressed air, that was a really good one. I have to remember that for some future presentation or example. Well, here we find ourselves a week after Easter, right? We're, we're, um, we have all that buildup through the 40 days of Lent. And then we have all these plans for Holy Week. And uh, if you were anything like Jennifer and I, you were running nonstop all that week trying to get to all the things you needed to be at, right? We were, we're still recovering from that, as you may guess, from all the things that happened. And all of this leads up to um, Easter Sunday, right? It's just this, this is the culmination of that time. And it's a little bit like going through Advent heading to Easter, right? Because when we are Christmas, excuse me, we, I, I really jumped ahead. We go from Advent into Christmas, you spend all this time, the whole month of December, the four weeks before Christmas, preparing for the birth of Jesus, and you have this huge celebration on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, and then everyone thinks Christmas is over. Well, it's very similar with Easter. You have the 40 days of Lent leading up to uh, Easter Sunday, and everyone thinks that after Jesus rose from the dead, they can, they can forget about all of this because it's done. And that's really the farthest from the truth because Easter began last Sunday and it continues for 50 days until Pentecost. We are, that's why Jennifer opened with Happy Easter, right? And we could, like, could have entered, uh, opened with He is risen and you'd say, He is risen. Oh, that, that doesn't sound near as exciting as last week. <laughs> he is risen. He is risen indeed. Oh, so you are awake. Very good. But, you know, here we are a week later, and uh, we've put away our Easter baskets, and, uh, you know, you've eaten most of the chocolate eggs you got probably by now. If you're not, you've stored them away for a special occasion, right? Or you maybe have eaten all the hard-boiled eggs. I remember the, uh, the, the, the week after Easter, uh, my mother would make, uh, you ever had creamed eggs where you cut up the hard-boiled eggs and you... Well, you don't want them really, but, <laughs> but we had those every day for a week or two until we got rid of all the hard-boiled eggs in my house when I was growing up. Oh, and, and, I, and I still remember, even with our kids, after Easter, we'd find those little bits of that green Easter grass, plastic grass, all over your house, everywhere you look. And you said, I didn't even buy that much Easter grass. How can it be everywhere? 
And it does, it just spreads, it multiplies, kind of like rabbits, I guess. I don't know, that Easter grass is everywhere. But we have this cultural practices around Easter, which are all about the holiday, but in the church, it's really about the beginning, not the end of the story, right? This is the beginning of the resurrection story. This is where we are from now to eternity. Being in this in-between that Jesus rose from the dead and we talk about it in 40 days of the ascension where he rises into heaven. This is part of our Apostles' Creed, sits at the right hand of God. And we know on the 50th day that the Holy Spirit came and made a huge difference to the people in that land at that time. And thousands of people accepted Christ as their Savior at that moment. And we continue into the eternal future. But it's, it's always interesting how in the church we get so excited about Easter and then, and then it all kind of lets down after that. And let me tell you, that's not what it's about. And the disciples were suffering, suffering with the same problem, don't you think? Because the disciples had been with Jesus for about three years, some of them more or less, but they'd been with him about three years and they'd learned so many different things from him. And all he would, they were so excited that they truly believed they were following the Messiah. And here he's arrested and killed like a common criminal and put in a grave. They've heard rumors that he's not there anymore. They're not sure what that means. He told them he'd rise on the third day, but that doesn't really happen, right? That's hard for them to even comprehend that. Well, and they had some women who had gone to the tomb that very day and had come back to say, he's gone. He's, he's not there anymore. He's risen from the dead. And they thought they were speaking nonsense. They didn't believe them. And so we have today's scripture reading which we read, always read every uh, year, or the, the uh, Sunday after Easter, because this is the first time the disciples actually encounter Jesus, the risen Jesus. And so here we have the 11 disciples, because you know Judas has already betrayed and left the group. So we have the 11 disciples that have somehow found each other again, because when Jesus was arrested, they scattered every which direction, because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. They were afraid that they too would be arrested, they were afraid that they too might face that same fate of crucifixion on the cross. They did not want to deal with that. They were distancing themselves from Jesus. But after he was put in the grave, they somehow must have had a, the gang hangout or something. They ended up in this place. The Bible doesn't really clear where they are. But they're in a room behind a locked door, trembling with fear. And it's the same day that Jesus rose from the dead, later that day. And they're behind these doors, not sure what to do next. And Jesus shows up. He appears amongst them, the resurrected Lord. He's right there for them to see, for them to talk to, for them to touch him. And Jesus says first thing to them, peace be with you. Because he knows they're probably even more terrified to see someone who just came from the grave, right? They're probably even more terrified about that. But here's their master, Jesus. He says, peace be with you. And the disciples are so excited. They're thrilled to see him. They're thrilled to see him. And Jesus speaks with them for a few moments and, he's, and he breathes on the, onto them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. I think sometimes we think the only time the Holy Spirit's active is at Pentecost. That's not true. Because the Pentecost, I mean, the Holy Spirit is talked about in the very first book of the Bible. The Holy Spirit's always been there. But the Holy Spirit of God is often described as the breath of God. Because we know that God breathed into Adam and brought him to life. And Jesus is now breathing into his disciples that they too are receiving the Holy Spirit. That they too are being uh, given this gift this gift of the comforter, the one, the, the, the paraclete, as it says, the one that will come alongside of us, the one that will be there to help us through life, to guide us and direct us in all of our decisions. They have been, Jesus is willingly and, uh, and generously giving them this gift of the Holy Spirit right there that same day he rose from the dead. And then he's gone. And the disciples are so excited about this. 
they're probably buzzing about what, what they just saw and how they experienced that. Well, then the story jumps ahead about eight days, it says in the scripture. And I'm not sure the significance of eight days, except it's a day later, the following week, that it was, wasn't on a, the, the resurrection day, it wasn't on the Sunday, the first day of the week, it was on the second day of the week. But Jesus appears again. And this time, Thomas is there. And I think much of the time we read this, we call this the story of what? The doubting Thomas, right? We tell, call it the story of the doubting Thomas. Because Thomas, the first time, when his, the, his friends told him that Jesus had been there, he said, well, I'm not going to believe that unless I see him. Unless I can touch him and I can put my hand in the wounds on his, touch the wounds on his hand and on his side and actually physically be with him, th then I'm just not going to believe. And yet, a week later, Jesus reappears and Thomas is there. And I think Thomas gets a bad rap with this, don't you? I think Thomas gets a bad rap because, because of exactly what we just said. We call this the story of doubting Thomas because we think it's all about Thomas being the one with not, not believing. Thomas being the one that is somehow lacking in his faith that he didn't accept the fact that Jesus was there. And every time I read that, I think, you know, he's just like us, isn't he? he not all of you from Missouri, but those of you that are Missouri natives know this idea about show me, right? That if you don't show me, I'm probably not going to believe that you did that or you said that or this happened, right? We're very skeptical people, right? We like to, the Missourians aren't the only ones that do that, but we do it so much they even they made that the model for the state, right? That uh, show me, then I'll believe you. And so Thomas is a lot like that. Thomas said, well, I just need to see. The other thing about Thomas I find interesting is that it says very clearly in the scripture that his name was Thomas, but he's also called Didymus. And actually that is the same name in two different languages. Uh, but what it is, is the word or the name Thomas means twin. And the commentaries that I've read about this say that Thomas probably was not his real name. That he was called Thomas because he that was to distinguish him from Judas because his actual name is Judas. And so Thomas is called the twins to give him a nickname different than uh, so he could be distinguished from Judas. So Thomas, who's a twin, and we don't know a twin of whom. We never know if there's someone else that, that he looks like or is a twin to. But when you think about it, we are a twin to Thomas ourselves, right? We are like Thomas ourselves. Because so many times, we need proof. We want proof. Many people who discount the gospel story are doing so because they say, well, you can't really show me God, right? You can't say, here's God. You can see him, talk to him. You can uh, be face to face. You can shake hands with him. You can do whatever, give him a hug. You know, this is the kind of proof that so many people want. And so when Jesus came back the second time, Thomas is thrilled because now he gets to actually witness this and he gets to touch him. And, G and Thomas says something that none of the other disciples had said. He says, my Lord and my God. Thomas now had received that confirmation that he wanted, that he confirming that Jesus truly was alive. <clears throat> truly, he believed. And Jesus says, are you believing this because you now see me? <coughs> because blessed are those who believe and have never seen and so Jesus makes it very clear that from then forward, many, many people, thousands and millions of people actually, believe in Jesus and they can't see them. It's like the air coming out of the compressed air can that Teresa had. That we can't see Jesus, but we have faith that he's there and that he did what he said he would do. He took our sin to the cross with him and rose on the third day so that we too can, can have eternal life through him. So the message of the appearance in the locked room is an essential lesson for us as Christians. And it's really not so much about Thomas as it is about the other disciples who a week later, more than a week later, are still huddled, scared to death behind locked doors. They're in a safe environment with their other disciples and they're not doing anything. They're not telling anyone about Jesus. They're not going out into the world. And in fact, this, this, the uh, scripture, or not scripture, but the sermon title today, I originally had show me, which is what got on the slides. And after I thought about it, I thought, you know, it's not really about Thomas, is it? 
is really talking about the rest of us. It's talking about how we go forth into the world. And I, the new title I have is one on your bulletin that says Behind Closed Doors. Because that's where I think most of us find ourselves so oftentimes as Christians. Is that it's safe in this environment. We're behind the closed doors. We're in our sanctuary. We can express our faith. We can share with others how much that we love Jesus and how we know that we've been saved. But you go out in the world and it's a totally different subject, right? It's so much harder outside these doors to truly be a witness for Christ than it is right here. And this, I think, is the lesson we need to pull most, most importantly from today's reading. Is that how are we going to spread this good news to others? How are we going to tell others about Jesus truly uh, died for our sin and rose on the third day? How are we going to be witnesses to his love and his grace? How are we going to live out our lives? It says that, that when he said that we're, the, the command, the new command was to love God and love neighbor. How are we going to demonstrate that to everyone that we see? How will we let others know that we truly are a welcoming uh, place? That we will allow everyone who, con who comes here to be a part of our worshiping community without fear? How do we do that? Well, the key is with the Holy Spirit. That you allow the Spirit to empower you. You allow the Holy Spirit to give you the words to say. You allow those holy nudges. You ever get some holy nudges? You know, like occasionally I get those like, oh, I need to call somebody. And, and I don't know why that, their name popped up in my head. But, I, but I, if I don't call them, I wish I had later. Because usually when I do, I know there was a reason that I've gotten that, that nudge. And you've gotten nudges too, right? You've gotten things in your life say, I really need to follow up on something. Or I really need to check on my Aunt Susie or whoever, whoever it is in your life. Somebody or something that God says, listen, for the Holy Spirit is alive and active. The Holy Spirit is moving within you. And that's what Jesus gave to his disciples the first time. And a week later, they were still there. That's probably why Jesus came back more than anything else. He came back to say, time to go. No more sitting around. Let's go and talk about the gift to the world. The <laughs> gift of grace for all people who receive it. And that's the charge for you. To take the Easter message, and not just the, the pomp and ceremony of Easter itself, but to take the, the core of the message that there's grace and forgiveness and acceptance for all through the love of Jesus Christ. Amen.